Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar by the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership, GARDP. My name is Chirin Derachoni and I will be hosting today's session on Progressing a Discovery Project, Criteria and Challenges. Revive is GARDP's education and outreach program. It aims to connect and support the antimicrobial research and development community by facilitating learning, sharing knowledge, and connecting people. These webinars are part of our educational activities. All webinars are recorded and are freely available to view after the live broadcast on our website. You can see the link on this slide. As well as webinar recordings, you can also read our series of articles known as Antimicrobial Viewpoints, where experts discuss various topics within the field. We also have a resources section that includes the Antimicrobial Encyclopedia. This has definitions of various important terms, and some of these include new videos where experts give further explanations on the term. As always, today's presentation will be followed by a question and answer session. So you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar from the questions panel uh, on the webinar control panel as shown on this slide. We will try to address as many questions as we can. And uh, if your question is directed to a specific speaker, please include their name in the question as well. Today's speakers are Ken Bradley, Dermot Hughes, and our moderator today is Karen Bush. Karen recently retired as a professor of practice and interim director of the biotechnology program at Indiana University. She is a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology and the International Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy. She spent 35 years on antibiotic discovery and development teams in the pharmaceutical sector, focusing on the discovery and development of antimicrobial agents to tackle antibiotic resistant infections. Karen has been involved with the entry of nine investigational drugs into phase one clinical trials. Author of over 200 peer reviewed publications and winner of several awards, including being the first female to receive the ISC Hamao Umezawa Memorial Award in 2017. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome Karen as our moderator today. Welcome, Karen. I now hand over to you to introduce our first speaker. Thank you, Shireen. It's a pleasure to be here. Our first speaker is Ken Bradley. Ken has experience in both the private sector and the public sector. He uh, was the professor of microbiology, immunology, and molecular genetics at the University of California, Los Angeles, and director of the molecular screening shared resource at the California Nanosystems Institute before he joined Roche in 2015. At Roche, he is currently Vice President and Global Head of Infectious Disease Discovery at Roche Parma Research and Early Development in Basel, Switzerland. I'm now happy to welcome Ken. Ken, the floor is yours. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, Shireen and, and Gard P for giving me the opportunity here on the webinar series today to discuss some of our early research and discovery activities in, in the field of antibiotics. And what I'd like to do then today for the next 20 minutes or so is walk you through um, some of those uh, high level uh, principles that we use for guiding our decision making and use three specific examples of internal projects where we applied those decision making principles uh, go no go decisions um, to enable ultimately moving programs into the clinic or to terminate them and redirect the resources uh, to those programs that are more productive. So I'd like to start with an end to end decision making framework that we apply here at Roche uh, in all of our drug discovery programs. 
And importantly, we start and end our processes with the patient in mind. We find it useful to initiate, before we even do any research in the laboratory, to first define the patient population that we want to treat. This helps to create a target product profile, or TPP, uh, at this stage, very high level, uh, that guides a lot of the downstream decisions, such as the modality choice. So as we think about antibiotics, there are multiple different modalities that one could start to use in a discovery program, traditional small molecules, therapeutic antibodies, bacteriophage, for example. And depending on that modality choice, then the progression of, of initial hit molecules uh, to clinical leads, or the hit to lead to lead optimization process shown in the middle, uh, will then uh, be dictated by what modality you're working on. Ultimately, the lead optimization uh, will uh, progress to a point where you have a small number of, of molecules that you'd like to profile um, in a number of, of more advanced preclinical studies. These can both be in vitro and in vivo, uh, ultimately leading to the identification and declaration of a development candidate that can be taken into uh, phase one clinical development or testing in humans. So let's start the process of first defining the patients. So what is the population you're after? What indications uh, are, are you going to be uh, treating with a novel therapeutic that you'd like to discover? And what pathogens need to be covered in order to treat that patient population? These decisions can have downstream impacts on the development process, including the cost, the duration, and specific risks, uh, both in discovery, but also in the development. And so one needs to, to make these decisions uh, with an end-to-end -end thinking about what the overall research and development uh, program will look like. For example, what patients are you looking to treat? And the, the figure on the left-hand side, we see an individual, a hospitalized individual. And in this case, an intravenous route of administration is preferred. And so already we start to understand some of the uh, modality choices and, and what uh, properties a specific compound or modality would have to have to be orally or to be administrated uh, through the intravenous route. Uh, one can imagine other patient populations where an oral administration is preferred, outpatients, for example, uh, community associated pneumonias or uncomplicated urinary tract infections, uh, where that also dictates the type of modalities and the types of properties that the, your therapeutic would need. Uh, topical administration could also be something that is of interest. And again, this all depends on that patient population that you'd like to address. The next is what indications are you targeting? So shown here are some of what we've defined as the highest unmet medical need hospital-acquired pneumonias, complicated urinary tract infections, and bloodstream infections. And depending on the indication, again, there are specific uh, traits of the compound that will be dictated. For example, uh, the penetration and, and exposure within the lung if you're looking to acquire uh, treat uh, pneumonias. Um, and so thinking about uh, which of these indications you'd like to go after can dictate things like where in the body do you need to have exposure of a particular therapeutic. Finally, what pathogens do you need to cover? Uh, again, thinking about where we see high unmet medical need, uh, specific gram-negative pathogens such as Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas acinetobacter, with resistance to carbapenems have been identified by WHO as high priority pathogens. But one could also think about uh, covering gram positives, so multidrug resistant gram positive organisms. And this will again dictate uh, your early assays and, and what types of, of compounds and or modalities you'd be uh, going after. Another example would be uh, mycobacteria, so NTM or, or tuberculosis, and thinking about how that would change the length of treatment and therefore uh, safety profiles of specific molecules that you'd be going after.
So again, thinking about these things early on already helped to set a list of criteria that are required for the um, progression of, of specific molecules through the early discovery phase. So now going to modalities, uh, this is uh, an image taken from a review published in 2020 in Nature Reviews Microbiology, which uh, was a landscape of the preclinical antibiotic space. And what we see is that a majority of, of the programs in the preclinical space that were identified here uh, fall into what is referred to as direct acting small molecules. So these are the more traditional antibiotics, if you will, uh, and about 46%, almost half of the programs were identified as falling into this category. But it's not limited to just these more traditional approaches. And, and you see examples of potentiators, so those molecules that augment the activity of existing antibiotics, repurposed drugs, so those compounds that have antibacterial activity, but have been perhaps approved for other indications. Uh, antibodies, so therapeutic antibodies, uh, and or vaccines uh, to treat or prevent uh, bacterial infections. Immune modulators, which target the host instead of the bacteria, are another uh, area of active research, as are antivirulence approaches. So treating, instead of trying to kill the bacteria, reduce its virulence or expression of virulence factors, thus enabling the, back, the body, the host, to limit infection. And finally, quite a bit of activity uh, in the area of, of bacteriophage uh, for treating infections. So the examples that I'm gonna walk you through are, are really uh, focused around the direct acting uh, small molecules or traditional antibiotic approaches. But before we get to those, I'd first like to take you through um, this discovery process and set some of the criteria for, for how we think about decision-making and progression of a molecule or series of, of compounds from the initial hit identification through the entry into clinic. And what we find is useful is defining at the outset a target candidate profile, or TCP, which is similar to the TPP, but really is more focused on the compound properties rather than the patient population. In this case, we have different gates or criteria for different stages of the discovery process, starting with lead identification, moving to lead optimization, and ending in the pre-investigational new drug or pre-IMD uh, preclinical activities, ultimately leading to the nomination of a clinical candidate. I'm not gonna take you through each of the, the green boxes in detail, um, but rather, and they're not exhaustive as a list of, of different activities and properties that we look for. But in a particular drug discovery program, each of these would be associated with a set of predefined criteria that we look for in order to progress a molecule forward. And depending on the stage, we don't have to uh, achieve um, each of those criteria in a single molecule, but rather show that within a uh, chemical series that each of these properties can be optimized ultimately with the goal of, of optimizing all of those properties into a single molecule. Uh, but at a high level on the left in lead identification, of course, what we want to look for here is, is that you have a compound that has antibacterial activity. It has to show activity against uh, a small panel, um, and in particular, we look for those compounds that have activity against wild-type bacteria, clinical isolates, not just com uh, compounds that are active against uh, strains that have been genetically manipulated to have increased sensitivity. And of course, you want that antibacterial activity to be selective. You don't want just general tox. Ultimately, the demonstration of activity in an animal infection model, uh, preferably a rodent infection model, uh, allows us to move into lead optimization. And here we expand the types of bacteria that we we uh, test against or the number of clinical isolates tested. It's important to understand resistance, very important to understand and get initial insights into the relationship between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics or the PKPD um, and safety. Uh, again, in, in uh, antibiotics, because ultimately we tend to administer high doses compared to other therapeutic areas, we often run into safety as a limiting factor. 
um, despite the fact that the targets for many antibiotics are not conserved in humans, the, the high dose itself can lead to off-target effects, and these need to be identified early uh, to inform the medicinal chemistry efforts to uh, find all efforts to, to reduce those. Ultimately, of course, what we want to move into patients are drugs that are efficacious and safe. Finally, uh, once we identify those that have um, the potential for, for um, efficacy based on preclinical data and, and safety, uh, we begin the, the pre-IND characterization, so human dose predictions, looking at routes of manufacturing of the active pharmaceutical ingredient, or API, uh, dose range findings, so looking in rodent and non-rodent species for um, safety and tolerability, and ultimately leading to uh, GLP tox studies that ungate the candidate nomination and moving into clinical development. So the first example that I'm going to walk you through uh, is a program where we uh, were looking for inhibitors of uh, the gyrase topoi somerase family, uh, and specifically looking for inhibitors that targeted the ATB binding site in these uh, multi-subunit enzymes. And, and in this case, it's the gyre B and RE subunits of the complexes. And these sites are distinct from the uh, catalytic site that's targeted by fluoroquinolones. Um, and the reason we were looking at the, this particular series or, or uh, group of inhibitors is that the targets themselves are clinically validated. There's a high level of conservation that enables a broad spectrum coverage of the pathogens of interest. And, and in particular, RTPP um, for this program is that it must cover um, the uh, Enterobacter aliis, Acinetobacter, and Pseudomonas, and specifically, not just carbapenem-resistant versions of these organisms, uh, but must cover all pre-existing resistance mechanisms. So we're really looking for uh, the ability to uh, address multidrug resistance and reset the clock on uh, resistance uh, in the clinic. In this particular program, and this is an example of, of um, balancing uh, properties uh, early in, in that uh, TCP and, and looking for uh, maybe not all the compound properties being uh, combined into a single compound, but looking for those that can be progressed and, and advance the, the series itself. So in this case, the table that I'm showing you here is, is a listing of compounds. So each row is a different or distinct compound. Um, and the different columns indicate the, the different uh, organisms that were tested. And these are MIC values, so looking for the act antibacterial activity or the inhibition of growth. And in this uh, panel here, you can see compound 10H, which is circled in the red box. Um, showed really good antibacterial activity, so low MIC values across the different organisms of interest in our initial screening. However, we did not pick this particular compound for progressing because it actually had four, uh, very poor physical chemical properties and very low solubility that limited its ability to be tested in animal models. Rather, compounds shown in the blue box, despite having higher MIC values for some of these organisms, had much better phys chem properties. And so were then tested uh, in an animal model in this early phase of lead uh, identification uh, to test whether or not the, this particular subseries or series of compounds uh, was able to have in vivo activity. And indeed, uh, the initial results were a go. Uh, we were able to demonstrate activity in a mouse thigh infection model. The y-axis shows the, the log uh, colony forming units per gram of thigh. And you can see the dose response. So as we increase the concentration of, of in this case, compound 17R, we see decreasing um, CFUs in the thigh uh, to the point where we reduce just below the initial inoculum. Well, I mentioned before that 17R didn't have great um, MIC values, but this gave us confidence to invest further into medicinal chemistry. And ultimately, we were able to uh, identify uh, two compounds shown in this table as compound A and compound B. 
uh, that did achieve the uh, criteria that we had set out at the beginning of MIC values of less than or equal to two micrograms per mil against an extended spit, uh, panel uh, of bacteria that covered um, carbapenem-resistant Enterobacterales, Pseudomonas, and Acinetobacter. So this was great news for at least this one component of the TCP, but there are other uh, criteria that must also be met in order to advance, including uh, safety as well as, as additional uh, efficacy models such as lung infection. Unfortunately, uh, in this case, the compounds uh, that were represented in the series did not demonstrate efficacy in the lung infection model, uh, nor did they have sufficient margins of safety in a, an animal uh, minitox model. And so ultimately, this series uh, was terminated uh, and um, we were able to redeploy those resources for other programs. So the next example uh, is again targeting the gyrase and topoisomerase family, or topo4, uh, but here we are going after the other subunits in these uh, multi-subunit uh, complexes, in this case gyrase A and par C, and the binding sites that we were looking to inhibit overlap with but are distinct from the binding sites of the fluoroquinolones. Mm -hmm. And these compounds belong to what is referred to as the novel bacterial topoisomerase inhibitor or NBTI family of, of compounds. Again, clinically validated, highly conserved, enabling broad spectrum in the same TPP as in the previous example. Here we were able to advance the program uh, a bit further and, and were able to demonstrate efficacy in a lung infection model uh, of pseudomonas infection. And this is shown on the, the graph here on the left-hand side, uh, where treating with a uh, compound could lead to a multi-log decrease in CFU in this lung infection model. And so although this was promising and, and there's a, a number of promising data points leading up to this, ultimately, Again, thinking about the need for safe as well as efficacious compounds, uh, we were uh, faced with the, the data that the compounds in the series had a long terminal elimination phase, so uh, they did not clear rapidly from the body. And so what you're looking at on the graph on the right is the plasma concentration over time, and you have this very flat uh, terminal elimination, uh, and this creates problems for us in terms of uh, predicting uh, human dose and e efficacy from in vitro or preclinical uh, PKPD models. It also creates problems with respect to um, accumulation and, and understanding where we would get uh, equilibrium following multiple doses. And really more problematic, um, it could lead to a tissue accumulation and uh, toxicities. And if there isn't a, a the toxicity observed, it would be very difficult to rapidly uh, pull somebody off because the elimination phase is, is quite long and, and quite slow. So this was a development challenge for us that we decided ultimately to uh, have a no-go decision and, and terminated this series as well. And so the final example that I want to take you through is, is one that actually the molecule is still in development. It's in phase one. Uh, human clinical trials. Uh, and this is an example of, of um, again, implementing those decision tools and adhering to your TCP, um, uh, but with a more positive outcome of being able to overcome some of the challenges were, that were identified in, in that process. So this example is based on a, a compound called Zosurabalpin. As I mentioned, it's in phase one clinical trials currently. It's a novel chemical class and this is pathogen focused, so it is specific for Acinetobacter. The program started with the acquisition of a macrocycle technology from a company called Transzyme, where a phenotypic screen had identified compounds with pathogen specific antibacterial activity. Moving from the hit through the lead identification process, we were able to identify a first generation lead, the compound shown in the middle, that showed good. Uh, very good in vitro activity 
and also some initial good activity in uh, rodent infection models. Unfortunately, when we administered the compound intravenously, uh, we observed rapid morbidity and mortality in, in animals. And this was hypothesized to correlate uh, with a phenomena that we had observed in vitro as well of uh, plasmid or plasma lipid precipitation. And so this is clearly a development issue um, for us. And the team went back to test the hypothesis that this correlation between uh, lipid precipitation in plasma and mortality and morbidity could be overcome. And they did this by creating a bespoke assay for measuring uh, in small volumes in high throughput, measuring uh, the lipid precipitation. And this was able to inform the, the MedChem program uh, to identify uh, changes in the molecule that overcame this. And, and ultimately what we found is that by changing the molecule from a basic compound shown in the middle to a Zwitter ionic compound, so changing the PhysChem properties, uh, was able then to overcome both the, the lipid precipitation as well as, as the morbidity and mortality. We ultimately identified a, a molecule that was safe enough to progress into clinic uh, and that is now currently in phase one. And so I hope uh, this has um, been instructive in terms of, of how making these decisions, uh, while they can be difficult decisions, and can lead to um, the difficult decision to stop a, a particular program, allows us ultimately to um, get molecules that have the right properties to move into the clinic. And I think it's also important to say that, you know, just getting to the stage and, and getting to declaring a clinical candidate um, is not the end of the game. And, and there are many challenges that are faced in clinical development. And so our goal is to identify those compounds that have the best chance of making it all the way through clinical development and making it as novel or new antibiotics for treating multi-drug resistant infections. And so with that, uh, and back to you, Karen. Thank, thank you, Ken. Uh, Okay, shall I begin, Karen? Uh, no, I'm trying to get my camera back on, okay. which is not not working very well. Okay, there we go. Uh, we appreciate Ken's uh, overview of the drug discovery, drug development process. We'll now move on to Dermot Hughes, who is currently a professor of medical microbiology Medical Molecular Bacteriology at Uppsala University in Sweden. He holds a PhD in genetics from Trinity College, Dublin. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Microbiology. He's been working recently within the Innovative Medicines Initiative, IMI, New Drugs for Bad Bugs, ND4BB, the Enable Project, since its beginning in February, 2014. The uh, IMI Enable project ended in 2021, and then the government of Sweden funded a smaller scale continuation project, Enable 2, to maintain essential parts of the antibiotic discovery platform. Enable 2 supports antibiotic hit to lead projects from academic groups throughout Europe. And Dermot has been a co-coordinator of Enable 2. His research interests outside ENABLE include bacterial evolution and physiology, with a particular interest in the evolutionary trajectories to antibiotic resistance and how resistance affects relative biological fitness. He has published over 100 original research articles, numerous reviews, many of them on antibiotic resistance evolution. And we welcome Dermot now. And it's now time for you to start your presentation. Okay, thank you, Corin. Okay, so um, you've covered actually my first few slides. So let me just say in general that 
I'm a fairly typical academic in terms of my background. I work on a lot of basic problems. As you said, the relationship to antibiotics has for many years concerned looking at the interrelationship between bacterial fitness and resistance and the way in which resistance can evolve. And, you know, this sort of reflects my title as a um, medical bacteriologist. But if I can just move this. Yeah, here we are. But I have another side which gives me a, an insight which isn't typical for many um, uh, academic researchers, namely that I'm co-coordinator of this organization called Enable2, which is an antibacterial drug discovery engine. And <clears throat> Enable2 uh, grew out of uh, my work within the original Enable, the Innovative Medicines Initiative. And this slide gives you some overview of that. It was a public-private partnership involving large FPA companies, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, AstraZeneca, Basilea, originally Sanofi, but then Evotech. A lot of um, small to medium-sized enterprises and a lot of academic groups. And Uppsala was the managing entity together with GSK, and I was lucky enough to be on the managing committee. So I got a lot of insight into early stage um, antibiotic discovery and development projects. Now, <clears throat> you see here in this um, section on the top right, all of the different um, small companies, large companies, uh, universities, etc., that were one way or another involved in Enable. Some of these people were involved in what we call the development platform. Others were um, companies or academics that brought in assets into Enable for development. <clears throat> and the essence of Enable was that uh, people could bring in their assets and they would be given a lot of advice by drug discovery experts uh, from the large pharma companies. And we also had experimental platforms that could actually carry out the variety of assays that are required to progress uh, a project from hit to lead through candidate and up to phase one. <clears throat> so I'm going to, um, I can change this again. Yeah. I'm going to focus for the rest of this talk on the particular challenges that academics um, encounter in this process. But just before getting into that, to show you how Enable and Enable2 works, we have open calls at this stage with Enable2, any academic group in Europe that thinks they have a potential antibiotic can. Uh, uh, let me see. We seem to be, yeah, <clears throat> can make a non confidential expression of interest. This is reviewed by uh, independent reviewers. These are experts uh, from uh, the, with a lot of experience in pharmaceutical uh, antibiotic development. They then present a full program to a portfolio management committee, which again is composed of experts largely from the big pharma industry, people that are currently in it or that are retired from it. But they have a lot of experience in how to uh, develop antibiotics, the types of things that Kenneth has been talking about, what it is uh, the goals that you need to meet, the target product profile that you're heading to, and they will guide programs to get to that position. And then we have the actual platform. This is where, again, we have experimental activities that will <clears throat> provide assays and expertise to these academic programs to help them actually develop their program. And there's <clears throat> a cyclic um, process here. Active programs are developed with advice for several months. They are re-evaluated. 
and they may be approved for continued development or they may be terminated. Again, very much what uh, Kenneth was talking about in terms of what goes on in big pharma. Now we come to the differences. If you're working in academia, you have very special challenges. And I, I think there are three main challenges, funding, uh, planning, and um, knowing where to go in terms of development paths. And this is what I'm going to talk about for the next period. <clears throat> so <clears throat> funding in academia, uh, point one here, research grants are typically awarded on the basis that you have a project which is scientifically excellent, will produce groundbreaking results and will result in high profile publications. All of these words are used in our research agency in Sweden, but I think they're pretty general uh, throughout Europe and most of the world. And <clears throat> the problem is, uh, to a first approximation, antibiotic discovery is not regarded as groundbreaking. It's very often regarded as just doing the same old thing. And it's difficult to get funding for this type of research. Second funding challenge is that uh, funding for academic researchers, researchers is very much aimed towards individual researchers. And the problem here is that antibiotic discovery is very multidisciplinary. It depends on teamwork. And <clears throat> an individual researcher in academia um, has a dilemma here in terms of finding collaborators that are willing to play second fiddle, that also have funding uh, to pursue the same goals. And in essence, this is just an extremely difficult problem. Third issue is that academic funding is typically set for several years, maybe three to five years. You put in a interesting research proposal, you get your funding, it's guaranteed for a certain number of years, regardless of short-term results. And again, going back to what Kenneth was presenting, you saw that in industry, um, <clears throat> projects are continuously being evaluated, similarly in Enable and Enable 2. And if you think they have reached an insurmountable barrier, they will be terminated. <clears throat> um, so antibiotic development has long timelines, high failure rates, and this isn't typically what a university wants. So how to get out of this type of dilemma? Well, sometimes the EU will have funding for collaborative projects. There may be special national funding for collaborative projects, but these are very limited and again, time limited. And <clears throat> what academics really need are resources similar to Enable that can provide them with the potential for longer term funding and in particular for the advice that they need. <clears throat> the consequence of all of these um, funding issues is that antibiotic discovery in an academic context tends to proceed as a side project. Uh, people have funding for some academically interesting research and they use a little bit of it on the side to develop some interest in antibiotics. Um, consequently, it moves slowly and without um, advice on TCPs and TPPs, it's very unlikely to progress in the directions it needs to. <clears throat> and <clears throat> just to emphasize that the whole process is multidisciplinary, regardless of whether it's in industry or in academia. So in academia, a chemist, for example, may discover something they think is a hit compound, but to go anywhere with it, they need to investigate its phys chem properties, they need to get involved in admit assays, they need microbiology, biochemistry, maybe structural biology, and they definitely need to get to examining in vivo activities. And the data from this has to feed back into the chemistry. There have to be iterative cycles. <coughs> And again, you have this dilemma, the individual star researcher versus a collaborative field. 
Now, the second issue in academia, and I'm very glad that Kenneth brought this up because he described how they initiate a uh, project in um, Big Pharma. And I don't think I'm um, misinterpreting it too much here. Uh, in Big Pharma, you identify a medical need, you carry out market research, you try to figure out uh, where, whether there's a space in the market for this new drug that you might want to develop, how it fits in with your portfolio. And when you've done that type of basic planning, then you decide how are we going to get a compound to begin developing. Maybe you screen a library or maybe um, you go out and you ask, what do other people have out there? Are there SMEs or academics? that we could involve or buy out or license or whatever, and then get working on the drug we want to develop. It's completely back to front in academia. You have individuals that typically by accident or by chance discover something they think is active and might be interesting. And then they say, what can we do with this and how do we do it? So this is how it goes in academia. You have chemists maybe making libraries, discovering compounds with antibacterial activity. Maybe you have people doing target-based design, fragment-based design, DNA-encoded libraries, again, discovering things with antibacterial activity. You maybe have microbiologists examining soil bacteria, discovering things with antibacterial activity. And <clears throat> all of this will initially have been funded as basic research or as technology development, and the primary aim will have been publication. And for an academic, it's a very big decision to decide to explore some of these actives further to initiate an antibiotic project for the reasons uh, I've mentioned earlier. They're going to have to involve collaborators. Uh, they're going to have to learn how to get where they need to get to. So this is a, a rather unkind summary of how academics um, deal with project direction. One level, some of them microbiologists typically will think it's all about killing bacteria, getting low MICs. And again, Kenneth gave that example where MIC is not the only criteria that you need to think about. Chemists will often think it's about making lots of molecules and showing how good they are at doing chemistry. Biochemists may think it's all about enzyme inhibition. Other people may think it's about getting nice high resolution structures of their molecule in complex with the target. Now, all of these from an academic point of view uh, are quite likely to result in nice publications and help an academic career. But we're a long, long way from having a drug that will treat a patient. The academic may go further and uh, be able to show that whatever they've discovered clears an infection in a model. And at that stage, maybe they start thinking about would this actually work in humans? And this is where they really need advice. They need to know um, how to get somewhere and where they want to actually get. So the TPP and the TCPs. <clears throat> and getting expert advice and criticism is essential if they're to have any chance of going further. <clears throat> so where can academics get this type of guidance? Well, they can read up about it. I don't think this is going to take them very far. They can meet experts, for example, at meetings, or what I think is um, the best approach is to have direct regular contacts with experts. For example, if the academic group was part of the Enable or Enable 2 or any similar type of project that would provide them with access to that type of feedback. The catch is typically to get into those types of programs, you need to have an antibiotic program that already has developed to a certain stage. <clears throat> Now, this is um, just a laundry list of some of the things that will need to be considered in terms of hit to lead and lead to candidate development. And what you see at the top outlined in green 
chemistry, modeling, and microbiology is typically where and, um, academics that discover some active compound will be playing around. They, they will do the chemistry, they will have some microbiology friends, they will do some testing for them. And very often they don't realize that they're going to have to head down this type of cascade. And to do this, they need time, they need money. And as I say, back to the funding issue, it can be very difficult in academia to get the money to carry out all of these assays. They also may not need to, or they may not know what types of values they need to meet and when um, they need to um, terminate projects. <clears throat> so again, another laundry list, just giving an indication of uh, a lot of the assays that they will need to be carrying out on the pathway from discovering an initial active to getting up to something which they could call a lead or that they want to optimize as a lead. <clears throat> and <clears throat> again, if academics are left to themselves, I say they're like curious cats. I mean, they will discover what they think are interesting things and go off on sidetracks carrying out interesting academic projects, but not focused on the um, goal of getting a drug. <clears throat> So here's a, a summary. I think this is the, the pathway from you know, a compound, an active compound or a target all the way up to patients. I think the academics are very good at identifying compounds, very good at uh, working on targets and pretty good at identifying compounds that have some antibacterial activity. Where they're bad is knowing what to do next and they need guidance in terms of target candidate profiles to get them through the hit to lead and lead to candidate stage so that they have something which might be suitable for entering clinical trials. <clears throat> and they also need guidance on strategic goals. Uh, there's going to be a lot of time and money spent on this, so no matter how they acquire this, you need to know at the end that there's going to be uh, patients out there that need this, that there's potentially a market for this. <clears throat> so my final conclusion slide applies to academics and from my experience uh, within Enable, I think this also applies to quite a few SMEs. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> that there are positives and negatives, that academics have many ideas, many interesting ideas on how to initiate drug discovery. They have many actual active uh, molecules that might potentially be starting points. They have a lot of technical abilities, but very often in very limited areas, hence the need for collaborations. And the negatives, uh, in general, very little knowledge of uh, development paths, very little appreciation of target product profiles, uh, a lack of funding to carry out this type of work. Uh, they have a lack of access to the assays they will need to move along these paths. And they're always under pressure to publish or possibly to patent too early. <clears throat> so bottom line is academics need access to advice on target product profiles and the pathway to get there, these target candidate profiles. And they also then need access to funding, which would allow them to carry out that type of hit to lead exploration. So with that, I'll leave it and go back to you, Karen. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much, Dermot, and thank you, Ken. We uh, have a quick reminder for the audience. You can submit your questions as shown in this slide. We'll do our best to respond to as many questions as possible. And during uh, your questioning, if you can have a question for a specific speaker, please indicate that in your question. So. We have a first question for Ken, dealing with your 
a slide showing the MICs and the selection of a compound that had suboptimal MICs uh, because you're favoring chemical stability. Can you discuss how you balance those two when you're selecting a lead compound? Yeah, so in that example, uh, you know, we weren't uh, identifying a clinical lead at that point in time. This is still part of the early lead identification process. And uh, it depends on the specific question that we want to address. In this case, we had examples of, of compounds with good MICs and, and those with not so good MICs, um, and uh, those with various different physchem properties as well. Um, the question that we addressed with the animal experiment that I showed was, you know, t picking those compounds that had the, the better properties um, for putting them into in vivo, uh, could we see that inhibiting that target, in this case, the GRB uh, RE subunits, could that result in, in a reduction in, in bacterial burden in the animal? And so we were able to match um, that compound with a, a, a challenge organism where the MIC was something where we could get the, the appropriate exposures to, to make that test. Again, what's important is, is not that every, at that early stage, that not every property be combined into a single molecule. Uh, that's ultimately the goal of the lead optimization process. Thank you. I have a question for Dermot. Uh, there was a question about whether uh, the criteria for awarding grants hinders the fight against antibiotic resistance. Uh, can you comment on this? And if you think that that may be the case, what would you do to change this? Okay. Well, as I said, academic grants are typically um, given for whatever is described as excellent research, typically basic research. Um, I think the people funding academic research do not think it is their responsibility to discover new antibiotics. I think they feel that this is the job of big pharma. The reason it's become more interesting for academics is because of the realization that many big pharma companies have left this area. Now, it's filled to some extent by special grants. For example, within Sweden, we will occasionally have some type of strategic collaborative grants or by EU programs like this, but it has to be covered by grants that encourage a collaboration because there's no way that an individual researcher can do any meaningful antibiotic development. They can discover an active and they're pretty much stuck very early in that process. You know, you get a compound, you can look at the spectrum of activity, you can look at the MICs, you can maybe do a few other things with some academic assistance, but you cannot go any further unless there are dedicated grants to encourage you to do this. And there's a, a conflict here between the academic urge to discover completely new things, novel things, which, you know, we, we maybe have no idea what their use will be now. You know, we, we would like to discover CRISPR. We would like to discover, you know, whatever the technologies or biological insights of the future will be. But <clears throat> making new antibiotics is not regarded as the primary job of academia. The point I was trying to make was that regardless of this, there are many, many academics out there and they are making and discovering many, many molecules. And some of those might be useful starting points. And we have a, a problem in how to find those and how to help them develop a little bit or be evaluated. I'm not sure if this is answering the question. <laughs> so yes, the funding model does inhibit it, but I'm not sure that the academic funding model should be changed to do what is primarily the job of the pharmaceutical industry. Well, to follow up on that, I have a question about how each of you feels about the academic contributions 
whether these can be expanded to include some of the activities of large pharma, or if they should concentrate on finding these new molecules and continue to go to large pharma for later development. Can Karen? Maria, I can kick off yeah. <laughs> on that one, Karen. Uh, it, so, you know, we interact quite a bit with, with uh, biotechs, SMEs, as well as academic uh, laboratories around the world. Um, and we do this in, in various contexts and for various reasons, but, but that innovation that's coming out of the universities, that's coming out of academia, is quite important, right? It lays the groundwork for a lot of the work that we do, our understanding of mechanisms of action, understanding of, of the biology of the bacteria. Um, and that, that goes beyond just the, the chemistry, right? But even in, in that context as well, um, uh, new technologies, whether they be high throughput methodologies, new chemical libraries, new chemistry synthesis. So there's quite a bit that, that can be leveraged and we do. Um, in a very thoughtful way, we, we engage with, with academics in that, that realm. So I, I wouldn't say that we, you know, just because we're pharma, we're not doing it by ourselves, right? Collaboration is, is really important in this field. Dermot? Uh, well, I agree with what Kenneth is saying here. Um, I, I think the problem is that in academia, you have this pressure to publish. And so there may well be things coming out which could potentially be of interest, which will be of less interest if they are made public too early. And <clears throat> there is the, the issue I kept harping on at that academia rewards individual researchers specialized in particular areas. And so again, you have this problem that many things will never be explored or developed to see if they might be potentially interesting. I just feel that there's a lot of many molecules and chemicals out there that <clears throat> um, could potentially be evaluated a little bit more before deciding, yeah, this is just academic interest that go ahead and publish. And I feel there's a gap here. We need, this is where things like the enable and enable two and so on come in. And, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about these because they're the ones I'm involved in, but there are other initiatives that will help academics to do some evaluation of their molecules, even help them to make new molecules variants around what they've initially discovered. And I just think we need a little bit more of this, and we need to make academics more aware of those possibilities. There is another question uh, about the margin of safety. When you put together TPPs, I think many academics really don't go into the criteria that are necessary for go, no go decisions. It's very difficult for an academic to spend five years with a, with a graduate student and then come up with a compound that's highly toxic that nobody would want to develop. Uh, but from the pharma uh, point of view, you do need to set criteria. And can you talk about how those criteria are set? Yeah, so Karen, I assume this one is, is for me at least to start with. Um, I, I would uh, say that, you know, the safety margins uh, themselves as a concept are, are something that it's not a single number, right? There's, it's, it's actually a fairly complex um, process to, to describe what the safety findings are. You know, are they monitorable? Are they reversible? Uh, how severe are they? Um, and that can dictate, you know, the, the tolerance for, for taking a molecule forward or moving a series forward. Um, you know, if, if the initial finding is, is rapid death of an animal, you want that margin to be very large. Um, <clears throat> if the, the finding is, you know, much less severe and it's something that is, is reversible and, and doesn't cause permanent um, effects, that's maybe something that, that you can manage in the way that you monitor or dose it in, in uh, 
the clinic. So, you know, it does take a lot of expertise. It, it takes a, um, you know, consultation with uh, specialists who really understand the, the toxicology and, and physiology to, to be able to contribute to setting those, those different criteria. And it's, it's really something that we do project by project, depending on the findings that we have. Dermot, would you like yeah. to comment? I'm not going to contradict any of this. I'm going to say that, um, again, without meaning to insult academics, that there are academics do not have a deep knowledge in this type of area, and they absolutely need to get um, continuous advice and input and criticism from people who are experienced in, in these areas because they are complex. But there is an additional point maybe I would add to this. Um, if you are working, and Kenneth brought up the example of uh, topwise summarize inhibitors, if you are working in an area where there are already known drugs and you maybe want to make an improved version of it, you already have a lot of background knowledge on what types of liabilities you might need to look out for. Again, academic might not necessarily know them, but within the industry, these will be well known. And so you can design a cascade of assays to you know, check out particular liabilities and decide whether or not you're going to progress. But for an academic, the most exciting thing will be you know, finding a novel target and a novel chemical. <laughs> And this sounds great because you know you you're in a completely new area. There is maybe no resistance out there, but you're also in um, an area with a lot of unknowns. You don't know what the upcoming liabilities will be, and the need for expert input and criticism is even greater. You know, so and this is the area we would like to be in. We would like to be discovering completely new types of molecules, novel mechanisms of actions, novel targets. But it's like we're entering, you know, a completely unknown jungle here. We have no idea what dangers lie in wait, and we need a lot of input. And so again, I'm making this appeal that, you know, academics may be coming up with interesting things, but they need a lot of advice and input to help them evaluate whether this as a path forward. And I would like to uh, second that opinion. I've worked in both academic and, and uh, uh, pharmaceutical research areas. Pharmaceutical people tend to monitor the com competition very closely to know what we have to overcome in order to have a, a marketable compound. And I think this is something that academics don't really consider. Some of them don't even know what the competitive compounds would be. Uh, this is where your expert opinions come in. And I don't think you mentioned a lot about the commercial input to the discovery project process. Uh, can you comment a little bit more about how important it is if you want to have a drug, something that's really going to become a drug. Ken, do you want to go first again? Why don't you take that one first, Jeremy? Oh, sorry, okay, I will then, yeah. Um, <clears throat> again, I would say, as an academic, I would have had virtually no knowledge of this, quite honestly. But from working within Enable and Enable2, I've been in contact uh, with a lot of people in uh, big pharma industries, and I've been listening to their comments and viewpoints and criticisms for a decade now. Yeah. And so I do know that one of the things that we ask our projects when they come into Enable is to um, think carefully about the target product profile and to think what the competition is in that area. What is the current competition? What's currently in development? What edge, if they are successful, does their potential product have over what's 
either ahead of them in the development cycle or already on the market. Now, the already on the market may well just be being active against resistant organisms or being orally available rather than just an IV drug. There could be some edge like that. But you're absolutely right. I mean, you really have to know, is there something in phase two or phase three or phase one that's going to get there before you do? And, you know, why is anybody going to buy your drug? And this isn't an area where academics are expert, but clearly for big pharma, this is a business. And yeah, they're very concerned about this. I'm sorry if I'm putting words in your mouth, Ken, but, but you know, this is, and because we, we are getting this input from pharma experts, this is what comes into the projects that we are helping to manage and develop. That's, they have to think in terms of, what do they have as a competitive edge and is there actually a place in the market? I could also say before I just uh, leave over to Ken, that in our portfolio management committee, we have had at various times medical practitioners. And it's very interesting to see the divergent viewpoints of medical practitioners from people in the f big pharma industry itself. Because medical practitioner very often thinks, yes, this would be a very useful drug, but maybe for a, a small number of patients. And so the economic issue uh, comes in here. You may have something that will uh, have a, a great medical use for one person or <laughs> 10 people a year or whatever. And who is going to pay to develop that? And, you know, even if it's medically valuable, uh, given the the market value of antibiotics projects like this unfortunately don't have a, a future yeah maybe if I, I can add to that i think it you know this is one of the reasons that we talk about the end to end and thinking about the patient and it's it's not necessarily the patient that's in your your clinical trials but you know what is the the patient or the patient population that ultimately prescribers are going to to choose your molecule over the, the array of different options that they have, right? So yeah, something can be very scientifically cool, um, but if it doesn't differentiate at the level of clinical data, um, it's going to be hard for that physician to justify making a choice for something new and maybe more costly versus something that they know and have experience with um, and potentially is generic and costs a lot less. Um, so that's that's an important point is is thinking about um, what is the real world example of, of how this is actually going to be used, and I, I think that also extends into the modality question that that I brought up at the beginning too is picking those modalities and um, you know some of those are are great ways to to push the boundaries of science forward and, and ultimately I'd love to see some of those other modalities uh, be important medicines. Um, but some of them also at this point are, could be very expensive or, or very um, niche indications that they could treat, right? So a small molecule is going to have much more utility than a, a gene therapy, for example, in bacterial infections. So just thinking about, you know, is this something that um, really has the ability to, to you know, have a, a, an opportunity to be used by physicians in hospital settings or in community settings, um, or are what you're tr doing tr is is trying to to push the technology and push the boundaries, and so those are very different end goals. Okay, I have a very quick question for you, Ken. Uh, yeah. How many antibacterial discovery programs are pursued by large companies like Roche every year? <laughs> Well, we, we don't talk a lot about the, the size of our, our preclinical portfolio. What I can say is that the um, uh, Roche Genentech family uh, currently have two novel class antibiotics in clinical development. So Zizorobalpin, which I talked about, which is specific for Pacinetobacter, and then uh, Genentech also has a compound in phase one development, which is a, a novel inhibitor of, of LEP-B, so uh, signal peptidase and gram-negative bacteria. Okay. Uh, Dermot, could you comment or expand on the origin of the lead compounds identified through ENABLE? 
Yeah, okay. Uh, I, okay, if I put this in some context, within the IMI enabled, we had slightly over 100 expressions of interest during the period we were active. And I think we were accepting them maybe for five years or so. We didn't accept things at the very end. And approximately 25 of those were passed by the Portfolio Management Committee to actually enter into development. And they typically lasted anything from maybe the shortest was six months when we discovered there was a serious error, but typically a year to a few years before they might be terminated or they reached the lead declaration or went uh, further. And most of them were from SMEs. Um, the reason, um, because I think that's where most of the uh, early stage discovery is occurring. Um, you were asking, sorry, Karen, I have to ask you again. Were you asking what types of programs they were or? What, what was, they were asking what the origin of the compounds. The um, Didn't GlaxoSmithKline have a compound in there also? Oh yeah, yeah. We had um, that was actually built into the design of the ND4BB. Thus, uh, the big pharma uh, had to have a collaborative project in there. So Glaxo and Sanofi had collaborative projects ongoing. Um, I don't think it's secret anymore because uh, some of it was published, but they were targeting uh, topoisomerase with NBTI type molecules. So there were a few projects of that type going on, but the others were kind of everything ranging from um, variants on existing classes, uh, polymyxin, for example, with some novel features, aminid glycosides with some novel features, to completely novel targets with novel molecules, which, you know, as you might expect, ran into uh, this type of unexpected problems because nobody knew anything about that class of molecule. Uh, we had peptides and small molecules, natural products and synthetic products. Uh, a range of things, but all direct acting and in enable all focused on the priority gram negative pathogens. So Enterobacteriaceae, Pseudomonas, Acinetobacter. There was a quick question about whether enable would have supported small biotech outside Europe, like India. Um, I think the answer is no. Uh, because it was specifically set up as an EU project to support industry and academia in this area within Europe. Okay. And, um, I can say Enable2 is, uh, for better or worse, the same. We're limited to supporting academics because we're supported by the Swedish government. So we're not allowed to give government support to small companies, unfortunately. And we're limited to Europe very much for practical reasons because it's the lawyers um, have decided it's the only practical way in which we can ensure that we're not unintentionally funding um, commercial enterprises. It's easier to monitor this within Europe. Okay, would you like to discuss in general how many early phase programs lead to candidates that make it to phase one? I think it's important for academics to realize the predominance of initial programs that uh, don't get that far. Yeah, so that's um, maybe uh, thinking about the, the success rate of taking things from the initial concept all the way through launched product. Uh, in general, uh, not just antibiotics, but in, in general for the pharmaceutical industry is, is quite low, right? So you're talking low single digit percentage. Um, antibiotics, we do have a high turnover, especially if you're looking at, at novel therapeutics versus making a modification of an existing class. Um, that number becomes uh, small as well. So it's, it's um, 
you know, down in the one to two percent of, of programs that are likely to, to go from early discovery, initial concept, all the way through launch product. Okay. Dermot, do you have any further comments? Yeah, it's um, a little bit complex because some of our programs entered at a hit to lead stage and some entered at a lead to candidate stage or lead optimization stage. But what I could say is of the approximately 25 that we worked on, I think today four or five are still being actively worked on. So maybe 20% are still in play. Now they are not at um beyond phase one i think we have one that one that came in as a mature product that passed through phase one trials but all of those that came in for actual development are sitting somewhere in the lead to candidate uh, pre-phase one stage and most of them have been terminated but there's a few still active so who knows Here's an interesting question. Ken, what are your thoughts on open science for antibacterial discovery? Yeah, so the, the um, various forms that, that we've seen open science, you know, in certain companies like a KHN have, have made a lot of their data um, public. Um, and, and I think that is actually incredibly useful in a field that is already quite difficult, requires a lot of collaboration. Um, you know, the, the economic incentives for developing antibiotics are just not there. So having access to, to information, um, especially from those companies where our programs that are stopped, I think is, is useful learnings um, for the field and helps us all move forward faster. Okay, um, we have another another yeah, long question uh, here. Aaron is is uh, you know of course publication is is one traditional way that that sharing information about programs can be done, but um, I think that the open access it maybe takes it a step further. That's my understanding. Dermot, do you have any comments on this? Um. I kind of agree with Ken on this. I, I think it would be incredibly useful to have access to the information that led to the termination of programs to get a better understanding of what the liabilities are and what problems were overcome and what problems were insoluble or regarded as insoluble at the time. Uh, when it comes to publication, unfortunately, you know, you get some information there, but it's necessarily very trimmed down just to get it into shape for a published paper. So yeah, I understand that for active programs, nobody really wants to give away all the secrets, but you would like, you would hope that for terminated programs, it would be possible. The unfortunate thing is that when a program is terminated, maybe people people involved lose some interest in it and there isn't maybe the incentive uh, to actually get all the data out into a publicly available form. I remember a program I was associated with at Squib in the 1980s that we were very excited about. We had a lot of uh, early data on resistance to sideriform monobactams. I heard many years later that uh, all of our notebooks were destroyed after they decided that uh, this wasn't going to go anyplace. And it, it really hurt me because I thought we'd done some pretty good science that was never going to see the light of day now. So open science, anybody who practices it, I give them a lot of credit. Yeah, well. I mean, talking with the various experts we have guiding us within Enable, I've heard anecdotally similar stories that, you know, in the not so distant past, much of the data was kept literally in notebooks. And 
people don't necessarily know where they are and nobody's going to go to the trouble of you know bringing all this into a, an accessible form in addition to which uh, people retire people die and a lot of the valuable information is you know in the head of those people and so we you know inevitably i think we will end up repeating uh things that we we could potentially have known about well we were told that all our notebooks were put on microfilm but okay. then we got to the point where there was one microfilm reader that was working and operable by the time bristol myers came in and this acquired squib and i'm okay. sure that none of those exist in a readable form anymore so uh, people tried I wonder about the digital notebooks that people are keeping now. In 20 years, will we be able to access them? Will our our software be able to read our files? So there's another question for Ken. Are there formal business development or alliance activities, efforts within Roche that serve as avenues for finding or scouting innovations projects externally that can be potentially brought in for collaboration or licensing work? So Karen, just to, to recap, this is a question about business development activities. Yes, correct. Yeah. yeah, so we do, we do have an active partnering and business development team uh, here at Roche that, that uh, we continue to scout the landscape, um, whether it's, it's a biotech, whether it's um, academic, um, and it's something that that we as uh, team members or scientists in the team also, you know, keep an active eye on, on literature, on, on meetings, um, and looking for for potential collaborations. Uh, as I said before, you know, we rely uh, on external innovation. Um, many of the programs at Roche, not just antibiotics, um, have had some some input uh, from external, whether the project initiated in, in academia or biotech or another pharma, you know, our, our partnering activities are very important for the overall, overall portfolio and pipeline that we have. I have one last question before we wrap everything up. We've heard a lot about the people in pharma who have a lot of institutional memory. Uh, some of us are getting to the point where our memories are fading a little bit. Uh, some of us have completely gotten out of everything related to antibiotics. We have a young generation of people who are being trained in antibiotic drug discovery. If their companies have folded, they've gone into different areas. Do you see any way that we can rejuvenate or encourage a younger generation of people to become aware of all the things needed for successful antibiotic drug discovery and development. Um, at the risk of um, beating the same drum over and over again, I could say that one of the um, I think big benefits of a, a project like Enable or Enable2 is bringing academics into close contact with people who have decades of expertise in the area and training the academics uh, to learn what's actually involved in progressing a drug development project. So besides the fact that we have actually helped progress some projects, we within this consortium have uh, gone through an incredible educational experience and uh, i think you know um, it has helped to train um, many adme experts chemists microbiologists whatever in the complexity of this area even though they are not within a pharmaceutical company so yeah and, and karen maybe just to add that um, I'm sure you're aware, but the AMR Industry Alliance, uh, a collection of, of different companies um, focused on, on the threat of AMR, uh, recently we released a report called Leaving the Lab, and that's available freely on the internet as well. Um, 
and it highlights this problem, right? So it's it's really focused on as smaller companies fail, as big pharma gets out of the space, what happens to those with the experience and expertise? And and we, you know, I think for the first time, uh, provide data in that report the supports the gut feeling that many of us have had, and that is that that we are as a as a group losing a lot of talent. Um, people are going to other areas. People are retiring. Um, so it, it is an issue. Um, you know, one one of the the hopes of, of this report is that it provides additional um, incentive uh, for changes in, in reimbursement and the reform. But um, you know, that's a different topic for a different day. I think. Thank you very much. I think we're getting close to the end of our Q&A session. I'd like to thank everybody who's stayed online to ask questions and to listen to what we have had to say. I'd like to thank the speakers, particularly Ken and Dermot, for answering a variety of questions, uh, providing additional insight into a very important area. Uh, Shireen, I hand it over to you now. Thank you very much, Karen. And thank you again, Dermot and Ken, for the presentations. I also want to say thank you to the audience for submitting, submitting their questions today and for tuning in. Uh, I just wanted to say that our upcoming webinar on the 23rd of April is now open for registrations. So you can find it on our website if you're interested please visit. I also would like to invite everyone to keep an eye out for our newsletter and also to follow Gartfi on Twitter, X <laughs> and LinkedIn to stay up to date with our activities. So thank you again, everyone for joining and for contributing to the discussion. I hope that everyone found the webinar very interesting and useful and that you'll join us in the future also to uh, help spread the word and encourage your colleagues to join. Thank you again, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.